From ABC News Live, your voice, your vote, 2022, Election Day. Here now, Diane Macedo. Hi, I'm Diane Macedo. Today on ABC News Live, we want to get right to our top story. Americans are casting their final votes on this election day in one of the most consequential midterms in decades. Here's a live look at a polling center in Palm Beach, Florida, a key state in this election, as voters across the country decide which party will control the Senate and the House of Representatives. Democrats' current majority on Capitol Hill is so thin, Republicans could take back both houses of Congress. They just need one seat to take control of the Senate and a net gain of five seats to take control of the House. Congressional correspondent Rachel Scott starts us off with what's at stake. Millions of Americans are heading to the polls for one of the most consequential midterms in decades. In the final hours, candidates from coast to coast making one final pitch and turning to the biggest names in politics to bring it home. Vote! Get out the vote. You must vote Republican in a giant red wave. At stake, 36 governor's races and control of Congress. Majority in the Senate could all come down to just a handful of races. In Pennsylvania, it's a virtual tie. The Democrat John Fetterman with an urgent plea. And everyone that's willing to go out and go knock on doors and to get out the votes right now because there is just so much at stake right now in this race right now. Republican candidate and TV doctor Mehmet Oz, laser focused on record high inflation and crime. I talked to families who are worried about their kids walking out in the streets, literally buying video games to them so they don't go outside because they're worried what will happen because of the crime. Nowhere is the race closer than in Georgia. Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock and former football star Herschel Walker and one of the country's most bitter races. Herschel Walker is neither ready nor fit to represent the people of Georgia in the United States. Senate. You listen to our president say that, you know, the biggest threat to democracy is voting for a Republican. No, the biggest threat to democracy is keep him in the White House. That's the biggest threat to a democracy right there. In the first national election since the January 6th insurrection and the Supreme Court ruling striking down the right to an abortion, President Biden warning that Republicans want to reshape America, insisting democracy is on the ballot. Today we face an inflection point. We know in our bones that our democracy is at risk and we know that this is your moment to defend it. Across the country, record numbers of early voting. More than 41 million Americans have already cast their ballot. And with contests this closely watched, election officials say counting the ballots will take time. Final results are not expected in many races, as early votes, mail-in ballots, and day of tallies are counted. Our thanks to Rachel Scott for that report. And Arizona has proven to be a battleground between Trump-endorsed Republicans and Democrats who are framing the elections as a fight for democracy. ABC's Zoreen Shah joins me live from Phoenix with more on that. Zoreen, let's start with the race for governor. Republican Kerry Lake, a 2020 election denier, is taking on Democrat Katie Hobbs, who was in charge of overseeing that very election as Secretary of State. So what's the latest in that race, and what are you hearing from voters on this? Yeah, Diane, this has been such an interesting race to watch. I was just at, ha at Hobbs' campaign event yesterday, and I spoke to a volunteer there, and one of the first things that she told me is that she is scared about it today. Meanwhile, later on that night, I went to a Cary Lake event. The first thing that people there told me is that they think it's going to be a landslide victory for Cary Lake today. Two totally different responses, very, very different enthusiasm levels, although both of those candidates are neck and neck. They're polling incredibly close, so it's going to be an interesting one to watch but one thing that they have in common that those voters here have in common for both of them is that they're really nervous about the election for totally different reasons you have Republican candidates who've been sowing doubt about the election and you have Democrats who are really concerned that a lot of these falsehoods are undermining these very elections you know I'm standing right in front of the recorder's office right here and I can tell you it looks dramatically different than I was standing when I was standing right here two years ago two years ago you had protesters inside who were able to access the area it's just totally barricaded now. Uh, meanwhile, Democratic Senator Mark Kelly is running for his first full term since being elected to the late Republican Senator John McCain's seat. Now, Republican Blake Masters is trying to flip that seat red again. So how are they spending Election Day? And what's their final message to Arizona voters? 
You have Mark Kelly, who is in Tucson. That's where he's from. He's going to be canvassing there today. He's going to be meeting voters. And you have Masters, who's going to be appearing with that entire, the rest of the slate of Republicans later on tonight in an event called Cowboys and Conservatives. What's really starkly different about these two is that you have Masters, who's been campaigning with all these other Republicans. You have Kelly, who's been sort of kind of putting out an arm towards some of these Democrats. He hasn't been campaigning with Biden, although he has campaigned with Flotus and Obama. He's really been trying to distance himself from the current president. All right, ABC's Doreen Shah in Phoenix for us. Thanks, Doreen. And despite the fact that she's running for governor in this election, current Democratic Arizona Senator, uh, Secretary of State Katie Hobbs is refusing to recuse herself from certifying the results. Assistant Secretary of State for Arizona Allie Bones joins me now for more on that. Allie, why is Hobbs refusing to recuse herself, especially given all the tension right now over election security, integrity? Wouldn't she want to avoid even the appearance of any impropriety? Well, there are, you know, significant laws and things that determine conflict of interest. And so far, there hasn't been any reason for Secretary Hobbs to recuse herself. We have acted, uh, our office acts with, you know, the utmost integrity and transparency. And I'm here today um, because we want to make sure that voters are hearing from someone who they don't perceive as being someone who's on the ballot. So, you know, our office is ready to take on this challenge. We have amazing staff that are doing their work. And we have uh, elections officials all across the state who are working in a transparent in an ethical manner throughout the day. So running in the election is not a conflict of interest? Well, if there is an issue that arises that that is directly related to the governor's race, then that is a conflict that we will address at that time. But for now, it isn't absolutely necessary to recuse herself from an administrative oversight position that is about ensuring preparation of all the counties and setting procedures related to elections administration that have nothing to do with, you know, tabulation of the ballots in terms of who's doing that actual work. So the counties are going to continue to do their work today. And and, you know, as the situation unfolds, if things change, then that we will reevaluate at that time. So who else is overseeing the certification process and how are you reassuring Arizona voters that their ballots are safe and protected? Yeah, so the certification process happens at many levels. First, the counties are going to certify their results. Their uh, boards of supervisors will do that process. And then those ballots come to the Secretary of State's office where they are compiled. And the results are certified by the Secretary and overseen also by the Governor, Attorney General, and Chief Justice of the Arizona Supreme Court. So it is not done unilaterally. Our office does not touch those ballots uh, at all. The tabulation occurs at the county level and they will go through their processes and make sure that everything is handled absolutely correctly and appropriately. All right, Assistant Secretary of State for Arizona, Ali Bones, we appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. And ABC News Live's special election day coverage of the 2022 midterms continues in just a moment. Stay with us. great victory for the American people. Today, the American people voted for change, and they voted for Democrats to take our country in a new direction. And that is exactly what we intend to do. Welcome back to ABC News Live special midterm election coverage. That was California Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi on election night in 2006, celebrating the Democrats' victory taking control of the Senate and the House. Pelosi, of course, later went on to become the first and current female Speaker of the House. Now, this time around, polls show the economy is the top issue for voters. And according to the latest ABC News Washington Post poll, more than 40 percent of Americans say they are worse off financially than they were two years ago. Let's bring in ABC News contributor Amanda Renteria, the former national political director for Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign, along with National Review editor and conservative opinion columnist Ramesh Panuru for more on this. Uh, Ramesh, Republicans have hammered Democrats on the economy, but Democrats say while Republicans have a lot of criticism, they don't have a plan. So what would Republicans do to fight inflation and help the economy if they win? 
Well, I think what Republicans would say is that the first thing they would do is stop. Um, that they would not go ahead with the big spending plans that um, the Democrats uh, have favored, um, that uh, they have passed even with warnings from even Democratic economists that they were stoking inflation. Um, but the fact of the matter is that midterm elections are not uh, cases where voters are looking at detailed policy agendas on each side and making their decisions based on that. It's a referendum on the performance of the incumbent party. It's a way of saying yes or no to whether they're happy with the way things are going. And right now, I think the answer is gonna be no. So Amanda, why should Americans trust Democrats to fix the economy if they haven't been able to do that so far, despite controlling Congress and the White House? So I think this is what's really important for Democrats to do. It's always been the case that folks focus a lot of time on making sure to pass policy and not enough time talking about what they actually created. The idea that this president actually created 490,000 jobs, that matters. We've got to be telling that story. The fact that child tax credit was an important point in reducing child poverty when the pandemic hit, those kinds of things need to be told. The Inflation Reduction Act that had small business credit uh, it, loans, those kinds of things need to be the story that Democrats are telling all across the country because then you can see why it matters to have Democrats in charge, why those policies can make a difference, even if you might not see the results today, right now, the fact that there's a plan and it's in place to move forward, that's why it's important for Democrats to be in office to make sure that we're really putting forward the policies that are going to help people in these moments that we're all facing a recession. Uh, Ramesh, uh, jeopardy to democracy has climbed up there in the polls in terms of importance to voters. Now, some Republican candidates have refused to say if they'll concede if they lose. Some have gone so far as to say they won't concede. So what happens if they follow through on that? And what's the point of running in an election if you're only willing to accept the outcome you want? Well, I think this is a very corrosive trend, uh, and it's something that has been gathering force in American politics for a long time, but uh, particularly uh, when Donald Trump shamefully decided to uh, lie about the fact that he lost in 2020. Uh, but I don't think that uh, voters are going to be um, casting their ballots based on democracy because I think there's a certain level of cynicism about the way both parties have treated this issue. Uh, now, Amanda, Republicans have also largely accused Democrats of being out of touch and focusing on the wrong issues. So if Republicans do take control of Congress, how should Democrats re-examine their strategy ahead of 2024? I think, again, I think it's really important to understand the Democratic Party is a quite a diverse tent. And so the idea of talking about women's rights has been very important throughout this process. Talking about what Democrats are doing for the economy is also really important. And talking about democracy, as you've heard in the last several days, in order to ensure that we have election integrity is really important. And so as um, Democrats think about moving forward, it will be important to think about where are those bipartisan opportunities. And this is what President Biden has been good at. He did pass a bipartisan infrastructure bill. Those are the kinds of things that we are going to need to look for going forward to bring our country back together again and move forward during tough economic times. All right, Amanda Renteria, Ramesh Panur, we appreciate your time today. Thank you both. Thank you. And ABC News Live special election day coverage of the 2022 midterms continues in just a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back to ABC News Live special election day coverage. Poll after poll shows the economy is the top issue for voters this year, and that could go a long way to determining which party controls Congress. ABC's Mary Alice Parks went to visit a community near Detroit where voters are especially concerned about the evolving auto industry. On the campaign trail, President Biden touting Democrats' big legislative wins this summer. My economic agenda has ignited historic manufacturing boom here in America. Where is it written that says we can't be the manufacturing hub of the world? Hoping that with gas prices falling and job numbers strong, Democrats can run on positive parts of the economy and new laws designed to help American manufacturers. Folks, since I took office, our economy has created nearly 10 million new jobs. 
more than 668,000 manufacturing jobs. They're betting big that Americans will overlook recent economic pain for a promise of tomorrow and get excited about a new economy, electric cars and more made in America. Let's get out of the way, everybody. <laughs> we set out to test that theory from Democrats. If voters anywhere in the country would feel the effects of new laws passed in Washington in their everyday life, it would be here, in this manufacturing hub around Motor City. Wayne, Michigan is a small town of only about 17,000 people, but home to a massive Ford plant. Good to meet you. Yep. We met with Mayor John Rasa. So there was an announcement during the pandemic that this is gonna become an, the electric highway, mm. Michigan Avenue. Just this summer, Ford announced plans to pump over a billion dollars into this region as it doubles down on electric vehicle manufacturing. Millions of dollars coming right here to the town of Wayne. With more than a quarter of Wayne's residents working for Ford, the news is vital, and the ripple effects for neighborhood businesses could be huge. But for residents here, those coming investments can still feel far away. Nothing's a given, you know, you just don't, you, you just don't know, you know, from day to day, but you know, it's, it's one of those things. You can tell Wayne is a town that has faced economic hardship, but also that it does not want to be counted out. The mayor tells us there is still anxiety about the shift to electric cars. I see the, the benefits, but I also don't know that the infrastructure is in place to handle that. People here are used to, to gas. I mean, this is just this is what we grew up on. We hop on Michigan Avenue, this main artery connecting manufacturing plants, and drive just a few miles from Wayne's small downtown to the Jack Demmer Ford dealership. How's business? Business is good. It's, it, you know, it, it's different, right? It's, you know, the way of doing business pre-COVID is completely a 180 from what we do now. So everything's more of an order to delivery. It's more custom. People are still buying cars. People are still buying cars. One of the major drivers of inflation has been the huge demand for cars. They tell me all of the electric vehicles they have are already sold. Sitting center lot, spot lit in the sun, are two new all-electric Ford vehicles. Yeah. Matt Demmer, who runs the dealership, loves to brag. Mach-E is absolutely fantastic. If you've not driven a battery electric vehicle before, it is absolutely insane. I think it, it's a rocket ship. He sees me eyeing the new F-150 Lightning and offers a test drive. All right, the car's on. Okay. You don't hear it, though. Right, I know, that's wild. All right, let's go down the street here. But he says he does not see his lot filled with only EVs anytime soon. They have to be affordable for everyone because we don't have that today. Outside of Wayne, in a neighboring suburb, we meet up with a group of moms, statistically more likely to be key swing voters in this area. On the issue of electric and hybrid cars, the group is torn. We just got a, a, an electric minivan, a hybrid electric minivan best thing we did earlier this year. My sister bought one a little while ago and she ended up selling it off again because the charging stations they either charge or it's just not as easy as they make it out to be. Front and center in Michigan this year is the state's governor's race, a race between two moms. Tudor Dixon, a businesswoman with a background in Michigan steel industry, is taking on the sitting Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer, who's running for a second term. Dixon has campaigned on Whitmer's COVID policies. She says that tough lockdowns hurt businesses and schools. So we're going to keep the schools open. We're going to keep the businesses open. We're going to bring back this economy. Whitmer often talks about maintaining abortion access in the state, but she has not shied away from the economy and has celebrated bills passed in Washington, like the CHIPS Act, designed to make sure more computer chips are made in America. Michigan is on the move. And with this CHIPS and Science Act, we can surge American manufacturing capacity and make up for lost time. The area's auto worker unions agree that the CHIPS Act is a big deal, especially as they try to ramp up making EVs. We build trucks every day and they get parked waiting for parts. Thousands of trucks sit waiting for parts and it's all because of the chip shortage. I sat down with some of the leaders of the local 600 UAW in their union hall. It affects the auto industry, but it affects you know, everything yeah. we do. That's the reason we're glad that the CHIP Act just passed because uh, this country's got to get control of that again. It kind of takes me back to days when I was a young girl watching the Jetsons and you think about the future and this is how it's going to be. I feel secure about my job. Whatever powers a car is an engine, whether it's a battery, whether it's a four-cylinder, whether it's a diesel, doesn't make a difference. 
For this group, if change is coming any way around the world, the key is not missing out. Vehicles have evolved for a lot of years, I mean, and this is a major evolution, but like I said before, it's coming. Whether it takes 10 years, 20 years, 15 years, five years, we don't know. But we want to make sure we're a major part in, in that process when it happens. All right, Mary Alice Parks, thanks for that. And let's bring in ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophorus, along with Galen Druk from ABC's 538 for more on this. Uh, thank you both for being here. Alexis, the economy may be the top issue in these elections, but how much could the outcome actually influence the economy? Well, Diane, regardless of who is going to be in control of Congress, uh, we'll likely see minimal impact on the overall economy, and that's because the economy is global, and it's influenced by a number of external factors uh, that a president or a Congress has little to no control over. As a general rule of thumb, uh, gridlock is good for Wall Street. Investors like to see the status quo and a split uh, government because it means that very little will get done. There's not going to be any major policy change with regards to energy, health care, uh, taxes. No one party can really implement uh, their agenda. But here is some good news, though. Um, usually post midterm elections, the market does get a bit of a boost. On average, the S&P 500 rallies about 13 uh, percent post midterms. All right. And Galen, President Biden has spent the past few months touting his economic policies. Has that moved the needle at all? You know, because the economy, and in particular inflation, is so concrete, it's so obvious to anybody who's participating in the economy, buying groceries, filling their car with gas, it's a difficult issue to message your way out of. What has actually helped Biden is that gas prices are down. They hit a high of $5 a gallon during June. They're now down to $3.80 on average a gallon now. So that is certainly a help to Biden. The other option he has is simply to change the subject. And we have seen Democrats doing that across the country. Looking at data from this election cycle, the number one thing that Democrats have spent the most money on in advertising is abortion. So think of that as an attempt to change the conversation from the economy to something else. Now, Alexis, our ABC News Washington Post poll shows more than 40 percent of Americans say they are worse off financially than they were two years ago. What do you make of that? And is any of that perception or is it all reality? Well, I think my takeaway from that is voters uh, appear ready to blame Democrats for the economic situation that we find ourselves in. You know, generally, um, presidents and lawmakers get far too much credit when the economy is good, and they get far too much blame when the economy is bad. Um, and again, the economy is impacted by a number of external events, things like the war in Ukraine, a global pandemic, uh, the weather. Um, but on the bread and butter issues, Republicans seem to have the clear advantage here. That poll you referenced, more than 50 percent of voters say they would trust Republicans more when it comes to the economy, inflation, and crime. All right, Alexis Christophorus, Galen Drew, thank you both. And thank you for joining us. I'm Diane Macedo. Stay with us throughout the day for continuing coverage of the 2022 midterms and ABC News special election night coverage led by David Muir, Lindsay Davis, and the entire political team kicks off tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC News Live. Don't miss it. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.